Welcome, everyone. May I have your attention, please? We're about to If I could have everyone's attention, please. Thank you. A reminder that this meeting will be on the record. It will also be streamed live on CFR.org and on the Council's YouTube channel. If you can take this time, please check yourself and other electronic devices and please turn them off so we have no interruption to our discussion or to the sound system. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Jonathan Tepperman, Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine. Um, this is a on-the-record council meeting on uh, Turkey. I was going to make a joke about the fact that um, Twitter has just been unblocked in uh, Turkey and now may have been unblocked at the Council on Foreign Relations as well. And I'm not sure which is the more momentous occasion. But <laughs> since you have to turn off your phones, I, I guess uh, it, uh, Turkey is still ahead of us there. Um, there's so much to talk about uh, given recent events that I'm not going to waste any time um, setting things up myself. Um, we couldn't have two smarter and more knowledgeable experts uh, here to break down uh, events uh, recent and less recent in Turkey for us. So I'm going to introduce them and then dive in uh, to about 30 minutes of questions of my own and then open things up to the floor for members. On my immediate left, of course, is Henri Barki, Bernard and Bertha Cohen Professor of International Relations at Lehigh. Henri uh, previously served on the State Department's policy planning staff. To his left is Steve Cook, who is a senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies here at the Council on Foreign Relations. Both of them known to all of you, I'm sure, um, directly or through their many books, op-eds, and essays. Um, gentlemen, let's start with last week. Um, when the AKP performed surprisingly well in these municipal elections in Turkey, holding on to Ankara and Istanbul, 45% of the overall vote. And this came despite what must have been the worst year in uh, Erdogan's uh, political life, from the Gezi protests to the corruption scandals to the sh crackdowns on social media, clampdown on judges, economic turmoil, and a January poll that put his personal approval rating at 39%. So the big question that I want to start with, and Henri, why don't you answer first, is how did he and how did the party do it? Well, I mean, the, shall we say, the quip or the easy answer is it depends on who you're running against. And unfortunately in Turkey, you really do not have much of an opposition. Mm -hmm. An opposition in the sense that an opposition that can actually generate new ideas, have a plan, um, uh, suggest alternative policies. And unfortunately in Turkey, the opposition is stuck. It's uh, the main opposition party, the center left, supposedly center left uh, party, uh, the Republican People's Party, has been polling around 25, 26% for the last few decades and they haven't shifted, they haven't changed. And in fact, in this election, if there's any party that did better than uh, before, it was uh, neo -national, uh, neo -fascist, na the neo-fascist, the Nationalist Action Party. In fact, I will dispute a little bit the, the numbers you gave about the AKP. Uh, those numbers that you say, um, the 45, 46% is actually a little bit inflated. It depends on how you look at the numbers, you can dissect them, but, but actually the AKP did worse the, I mean, the AKP is the, being the Mr. Erdogan's party, did actually worse, considerably worse than it has done before in national elections. There is a slight, there's a, in, there's a decline. They've lost about two million votes um, and compared to the last you know, general election. So it's, they won, but there's a serious asterisk. They won, there's no question they won, but they won because the Turkish opposition I actually quipped once, I said there was a better opposition party in the Neolithic times yeah. probably than now in Turkey. And Steve, would you go so far as to say that this was a, a, as much a vote against the opposition as it was for the AKP? 
Well, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you all for, for coming this afternoon. I, I would say that it, it, the opposition, as Henri said, is essentially nowhere. They're, they have no vision for Turkey's future. I think that that's part of, uh, part of Turkey's problem. I also think that Erdogan, since the Gezi Park protests, have fra has framed the issue in a way that is extraordinarily cynical and extraordinarily politically effective. And that is that he has said through each one of these political challenges that he has encountered, he has said, this is the fault of foreign forces. Uh, during the Gezi Park protests, it was the interest rate lobby, the Zionists, the bankers lobby. Uh, the most recent, the corruption scandal that broke on December 17th, this was a, a, a dirty uh, scandal uh, that was conducted by a parallel state in cahoots with uh, the United States and other Western powers. In fact, he fingered U.S. Ambassador uh, Frank Ricciardoni as orchestrating all of this to a core constituency of the AKP, which is larger than most people had suspected, uh, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, it makes a lot of sense in the context of the Turkish educational system. It makes a lot of con uh, sense in the context of people who have a reason to be paranoid in, uh, in Turkish society and Turkish politics. So that it, all of these issues were framed in a way that no one who was going already predisposed to vote for the AKP, as well as others, were uh, going to accept any culpability on the part of Erdogan or any member of the AKP. It was all this foreign plot. In addition to the fact that even- Hold on, are you saying that everyone in his base accepted these claims? There, uh, you, in the lead up to the municipal elections that we just had, hundreds of thousands of people coming out to cheer for Prime Minister Erdogan, where he gave these kinds of explanations for what were happening that were received extraordinarily well. It, again, going back to June when I was, in, uh, I was in Istanbul during the Gezi Park protests, I went to the big Istanbul rally in support of Erdogan, and this was the kind of stuff, and it has been framed that way ever since. The last issue I think that is important is that with all of these revelations about corruption, uh, there was this expectation on the part of outside observers that, that this would have a dramatic impact on Erdogan. But if you're an average Istanbuli and uh, the AKP candidate is running against the Republican People's Party, this center-left party that Henri mentioned, who has a reputation for being extraordinarily corrupt, but the AKP in the previous decade has given you running water, has uh, put money in your pocket, transportation options, and health care, there is such a thing called Erdogan care, uh, that uh, you all things being equal, you're going to vote for those people rather than the people who didn't care about you, who are kind of this leftist, sort of leftist center elitists who never cared about you uh, and who are just as corrupt. And I think that's the reason why they, they tallied as much as they did. One of the big subplots uh, in the, um, over the course of the last six months amidst all the controversy was, of course, the, the, the increasing battle between Erdogan and his former allies in the, in the Hizmet, in the Gulen movement. Um, has Erdogan won, or is this battle still very much um, being waged? Yeah, for me. Henri? Um, he who loves, laughs, laughs, loves best, they say. So I actually don't know yet. I mean, if you were to bet at the moment, you have to bet on Erdogan because he's, he's a formidable politician. I mean, let's face it. Uh, and as Steve said, you know, Erdogan care actually works. And, um, and more importantly, the answer to the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? That's also, and the answer is posi an absolute positive. The people are much, much better off today. It's not necessarily Erdogan's success. Um, when it comes to the Gulen movement, and then just two seconds on the Gulen movement, Gulen, uh, Fethullah Gulen is this um, religious cleric who happens to live now in Pennsylvania, not far from my way where Lehigh is. Um, and um, Have you had him come to speak? Well, I'll try next uh, time. You, uh. Henri stops to get instruction. Right, that's right. That's what people think. That's why I'm at the. <laughs> of course. Um, but no, the truth is, he's supposed to be a charismatic um, uh, preacher. I don't get the charisma part. Uh, I've met him once, but. Um, but it's not aimed at people like you. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Steve. Right. But. Um, no, but look, he, he has a great deal of influence. It's a very smart organization that has 
business, organ uh, business enterprises, newspapers, lots of schools all around, including the United States, including Texas, believe it or not. Um, but he, people assume that he would be able to carry or have his disciples vote en masse against, against Erdogan. The truth is we do not know how many followers he has, but it is, it is substantial. Um, the movement and Erdogan broke wi with each other sometime over the course of the last, last couple of years. Those two were uh, close allies, and they were close allies because both were fighting one enemy, and the enemy was the military. The military, which in Turkey has uh, Steve Rodabat, which has um, interfered in politics all the time. The, the military has been defeated. They've been defeated thoroughly. They're no longer a political factor today. Doesn't mean they won't come back, but at the moment they're not. So once the military was defeated, these two groups um, s separated. I think people exaggerate the importance of the Gulen movement, uh, but it was also for Erdogan a very easy foil to blame the corruption investigations and all everything that's, that went wrong with him. Um, so yes, there's been a split between the, between the two, but in fact, I think we're realizing that that split is significant, but not as significant as people would think it was. In part because Erdogan no longer needs the Gulenists the way that he once did when the military was still such a presence? Uh, that's, yeah, well, he thinks he doesn't need the Gulenists. Yeah. Now, when you look at the election results and you do the analysis of election results, you realize that Erdogan's party lost between the last national elections and now about two million votes. Whether those two million are Gulenists, I don't know, but he lost two million votes. And when you think about Erdogan's, I'm sure we'll talk about later, the ambitions about becoming president, those two million votes become, become right. effective. But he doesn't think he needs the Gulen movement and he can dis dispense with it. And, um, I think he may be wrong, wrong about that. Not that Gulen movement is strong, but, but because it was a big tent, it was a big coalition. The moment you start kicking people out of the coalition, uh, then you, you, I think you're in trouble. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, Erdogan's presidential ambitions, so let's just get right to it. Let's fast forward to August. Um, I want you each to answer quickly or briefly what do you think will happen, and then we can pull back and talk about what the implications of that will be. So Steve, what's your prediction? Um, there is a lot of smoke uh, going on about uh, Erdogan's uh, presidential ambitions. I will stick to my prediction that I made last spring uh, after the Gezi Park protest that uh, Erdogan remains the prime minister of Turkey. It is easier to change the bylaws of the Justice and Development Party to allow him to remain in the prime ministry than it is for him to move up to the presidency and reconfigure the powers of the presidency that he'll want to have if he, uh, if, he, uh, if he becomes the president. So I say he remains prime minister. And he has time to do that, to change the bylaws between now and, and uh, I, I, He does. Yeah. Uh, I, the question is whether he feels that, that time pressure because the presidential elections are right. coming up. But they can do that relatively quickly. Right. It's the easiest path for him. And he retains his parliamentary immunity in the process. Henri, I've been told by people in Turkey that there would actually be quite a bit of opposition within the party to changing the bylaws. Do you think it's as easy as, as Steve does? No, changing the bylaws I think is, is very easy. I mean, um, th that's not a problem. And it is also to the advantage of some people uh, in the party because you, if the, 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 what are the bylaws? The bylaws says that you can run in three ele consecutive elections. Then you have to take one, shall we say, one, uh, one election off before you can become a candidate again. So Erdogan, who's run, who's run three times, and a whole slew of the leadership of the ruling Justice and Development Party would all have to leave and sit it out for a year. Right? So that's the bylaw of the AKP, of the ruling Justice and Development Party. But you can change that. I mean, it's like Nasser resigning and then the next day coming back to, uh, to, uh, to power. I will differ a little bit with Steve. Um, I was, I thought that the presidency was exactly what he was gonna go to, but after these elections, it's a little bit more problematic. Uh, and I will kind of tell you what, um, I'll give you probabilities. I think, that, I think, I still think he wants to be the president. Now, in Turkey, the presidency is more symbolic 
real power is in the prime minister's um, office. But you have to understand that Erdogan is a person who not only feel, fills up any vacuum, but every nook and cranny of Turkish politics. He's, he has that kind of personality. So even if the presidency is not as powerful as the prime ministership, I think the bully pulpit and his, uh, his control over the party is so I intense, immense, that he can still go and be the president and st without changing the constitution um, and still exercise enormous amount of power. But this the thing I mentioned earlier, the fact that the AKP lost two million votes must make him rethink things. One. Two, the opposition in the party is not, c uh, is the, there are a number of people in the party who would like the current president, Abdullah Gül, to become the new prime minister. Kind of a have a Medvedev uh, Putin thing, except that Med Gül would have much more power than Medvedev has. Um, but Prime Minister Erdogan doesn't want Gül to be the, the, the new prime minister, but he may not have a choice on that. That's, and that's what he's calculating at the moment. So they, if I were to say, the chances are 40% he becomes president with Gül as a prime minister, 30% um, president with um, prime Gül, some, uh, um, I'm sorry, 30% Gül remains as president and he remains as prime minister and a 20% chance that he, remain, he becomes president and somebody else becomes the prime minister, somebody he can, he can control. Mm -hmm. Ideally, that's what he wants. He wants to become the president and have some kind of a lackey, because Gül is, would not be his lackey, because Gül has his own base in the party, a lackey who will, do, who will say yes, sir, and do exactly what the president. But I think th those are the odds. I mean, so the odds are still in favor of him becoming president. Now, Gul has, of course, over the last couple of years, worked very hard to establish himself, to separate himself from Erdogan and establish himself in the public eye as a more moderate, more market-friendly version of uh, an AKP leader, which suggests that he does have some ambition, although the level of his ambition seems unclear. What is your sense of his, um, his stomach for conflict at this point? Will he go along with uh, whatever Erdogan decides to do? Well, let me just quibble with your market-friendly description. Mm -hmm. When you said Gül is more market-friendly, actually, I think actually Erdogan is very, very market-friendly. Although all these markets work to his party's advantage. <laughs> I mean, no, no, uh, the corruption in Turkey is actually, the co Erdogan's corruption is actually a very interesting type of corruption. We should be very careful. I mean, this is not a guy who wants to buy the biggest yacht Compete with Abramovich and go to Saint Tropez and watch people on the beach. Um, Erdogan wants to create an empire in Turkey and abroad, and all that money that's coming in is used essentially to buy off NGOs, to buy off religious groups, to buy off individual newspaper men, uh, newspaper women, uh, journal, newspapers. That's the kind of corruption. Yes, there are the, the former minister of the EU like to. So that's it's different. The when I speak corruption. of market friendliness, I'm talking more about Erdogan's uh, excoriation of the international financial community and of the interest rate lobby, and at a time when Turkey's economy is really struggling. No, I would also disagree. The Turkish economy is not, compared to many other parts of the world, uh, you'd rather be in Turkey if you than in. Uh, 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 what What's the current forecast? A 1.3 percent growth rate for 2014. That's not great. 4.4 percent for last year. That's mm. not bad. But the, the trend line is negative. Well, let's, well, no, I, let, let's see. I, 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 I don't want to uh, monopolize the thing. But anyway, the, 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 the question about, I don't think, I think both of them are market friendly. I don't think excruciating the, the outsider, the, the foreigner, is a, is, is a normal practice in Turkey. So I would not put that much uh, stock in, in, in that. He's very, very, I mean, these guys are businessmen. Erdogan especially is a businessman okay. at the core. So whatever their differences, do you think Gul has the stones to take on Erdogan? No. No, I think I, I think that you know anybody who's met him and and listened to what Gould has to say, uh, I think it's fairly clear in that uh, very statesman, diplomatic, Gulian kind of way that he disapproves of the way in which Erdogan has handled politics in Turkey over the course of the last three years, w without a doubt. And I think that there are many many Turks, there are probably even people within the AKP, the AKP, who want Gould to take it to Erdogan and and and. And, and take a stand. I don't think he has the 
guts to do it, to have the fight, because Erdogan is one, an amazing, amazing politician. He is, I think, singular uh, in, in Turkish politics, in history. Uh, and we've seen that the Gulen movement has thrown everything it possibly can at the guy, and he has won over and over again. I think that Gul does have a base within the AKP, but everybody within the party who holds a position of import from, from uh, ministers to uh, parliamentary backbenchers essentially owe their position to Erdogan at this point. So uh, he may have people on the outside, he may have people making that pilgrimage to Chankaya Palace and saying, please, but he faces a range of constraints, including this, who is going to be his support within the party, who is going to, in addition, that the AKP has been the vehicle for Gul's own success, for the transformation of Turkey. He may not approve of what has happened over the course of the last three years, but there is that fear that has to weigh in his mind that by splitting the AKP, if he could, mm -hmm. that the AKP goes the way of the Motherland Party and the True Path Party. Does anybody remember those parties? Those were parties that dominated Turkish politics in the 80s and 90s and have drifted into oblivion. Now, that's not necessarily what would happen to AKP or a split AKP overnight. But it would leave this whole project, the Erdogan, Gul, Orange, this whole vision of Turkey would be vulnerable to its opponents, primarily the Kemalists, who have not gone anywhere. So I think that Gul recognizes that Erdogan uh, has made uh, mistake after mistake after mistake, alienated what had been a broad constituency for the party, but he has no place to go. Mm -hmm. So, and he's risk averse. Uh, Gul is very yeah. risk averse. So, six months, eight months from now, uh, whatever the particular details, Erdogan remains uh, the man in charge. Uh, where does he take Turkey in the next year or two? Do we see more of the same in terms of um, turmoil, clampdowns, a uh, constriction of social and civic space? Uh, or does he now relax um, once he feels his power has been reaffirmed? I think he won't relax. The reason I say this is because something has changed in Turkey fundamentally in the last eight to nine months, starting with the Gezi protests, but especially after the corruption scandal and these elections. And what is that? It used to be that you would talk to people, people who absolutely disliked, hated Erdogan and company, but said, hey, A, he's legitimate, he won elections free and, and clear. And B, let's face it, he produces. I remember talking to one of Turkey's largest, largest, largest businessmen, and then we were talking, and I, and I said, look out of the window. I said, you know, Istanbul, I, Istanbul, I remember of, uh, in, uh, of two, two and a half million people where every day you had water problems. Today, Istanbul has 14 million people, and there's never a water problem, right? And he said, let's face it, they do a good job. Now, most of the people who grudgingly acknowledge that Erdogan now think he's illegitimate. I mean, th there's been such an enormous break, I think, in, in Turkish politics that each side sees the other as, as illegitimate. When you read a pro-Erdogan press, which is about 60% of the Turkish press these days, I mean, the, the venom with which they attack the other side, that, that they really should not exist uh, politically. And, and vice versa to some extent. So there is, there is this huge break in Turkey now which each side sees the other side as being legitimate. Therefore, I think, you know, maybe in that sense your, pro your, your economic prospect is correct. I mean, you need to really to uh, fasten your seatbelt because it's gonna be a rough ride. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a, a couple of thoughts on that. One, I think that Turkey is a, a, a case study in the reversibility of democratic reform. Uh, this is the same prime minister who oversaw nine constitutional packages that allowed Turkey to get a formal invitation to join the European Union. Now, Europe is off the table now, right. but what they've done is, essentially, over the course of eight, nine months more, reversed many, and, and the writing was on the wall well before that, that they were reversing these uh, the kinds of strengthenings of freedoms of the press and freedom of expression and so on and so forth. So I think Turkey will be more authoritarian. I think it will, ironically, for the party that really brought Turkey to the world, is going, it, they will look inward. We will return to a kind of prickly, insular, nationalist Turkey. And then the other thing, Henri just said something that made me think about this. He said, you know, these guys really get things done. In this massive purge of the Turkish bureaucracy, who is going to take over and deliver? 
I think you have a hollowing out of the Turkish government so that when it comes to big infrastructure projects, when it comes to law and order, when it comes to these kinds of things that we have come to expect in the AKP era, you have either inexperienced people who are going to be having to carry these things out or no one. So I think that the capacity of the Turkish government to deliver on things like transportation alternatives, Erdogan care, uh, potable water, and so on and so forth, is going to be severely compromised going forward. Uh, let me ask a question on behalf of the Zionist uh, interest group, uh, foreign uh, American lobby that's done so much to damage Turkey's chances over the last year, and ask what uh, what. Uh, according <laughs> to the Turkish Twitter sphere, we are the two leaders of that. Well, then you're the pure, <laughs> perfect people to ask. We'll sign autographs after. <laughs> what? Uh, what uh, and if if you have market tips for us, we'll take this as well. <laughs> what does all of this mean for uh, relations between uh, Ankara and, and Washington? Remembering that just a little while ago, President Obama was still talking about Erdogan as one of his best friends internationally. Uh, look, on May seventeenth of last year, Prime Minister Erdogan was ha was having dinner at the White House with his Foreign Minister and his Intelligence Chief, and he's. President Obama, I don't think, very often invites people to his house uh, for these, you know, kind of. I mean, it was a big honor. Two weeks later, the famous protests started in Istanbul and elsewhere, and the the the, the reaction from from the pro Erdogan press, from the government, from Erdogan himself, was all these conspiracy theories, and I think. Did, this did much more damage than the rough way in which the Turkish police handled the demonstrators and stuff like that. People, I think, outside, especially in Europe and the administration here, were kind of really shell-shocked by the rhetoric. By the way, we, we forgot to mention one major culprit, Lufthansa. You don't know how evil the company Lufthansa <laughs> is because they are the ones who started this protest in, in, in mm -hmm. last May. Of course. Uh, but jokes aside, no, the truth is, I think people were taken aback. I mean, two, two weeks after you're having dinner with the president who's been your, one of the biggest booster, you're blaming the United States and its allies for m trying to mount a coup, essentially. Um, so relations, I think, with Turkey and Europe are, are deteriorating. But you also have to remember another thing, and that is that Turkey is, if you were to make a list of all the countries with which the United States has daily interactions with and the, 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 the width of the interactions and the depth of the interactions. I think England, uh, the UK, I mean, there are very few countries that are as, as important to the United States as Turkey. It's not just NATO, it's, a, it's Syria, it's Iran, it's Iraq, it's Russia now. Ukraine, these are on foreign policy, but there's also economics, there's there are all kinds of trade issues, the terrorism cooperation. I, on a daily basis, there are thousands and thousands of interactions between American officials and Turkish officials. So Turkey is far too important, right? Even if the relations between Obama, uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Erdogan go south, <coughs> Turkey and the United States still have to work. They do not have a choice mm -hmm. on, on, on this matter. But it, it, there's a very sour taste, I think, in, in Obama's mouth about Turkey. But on Europe, and that's why I think the relationship uh, where, it, uh, where it's more problematic, it's true that Europeans were never gung-ho gung about Turkey. But here you have a prime minister whose conversations have been released now, taped conversations, where he's directly interfering in the press. He's calling from Morocco. He's on a state visit to Morocco. He's calling from Morocco, and to calling a, a, new, a television um, uh, chief and saying, I don't like the, you know what that? The, the crawl. The, the crawl. The, I don't like what's on the crawl. Change the crawl on the television network. This is the kind of micromanagement of the press <laughs> that he's doing. He's, he's firing journalists. I mean, we've had all these conversations. And he has not denied them, by the way, those. And so, if you are a European leader, how can you, or European public, how can you accept a country where the prime minister essentially fires and, and hires journalists and interferes with, I mean, this is, and even for us, it's a First Amendment. I, I think European-Turkish relationship are so broken now in terms of the EU accession that it's going to take a more than a generation to fix. Just quickly, uh, I, 
up until about 2010, or actually well into 2011, the White House had three points in which there was the basis for uh, its relationship with Turkey. And one of them was that Turkey was a model for the Arab world. And they, in fact, used that, that word. They never uttered it publicly, but that was their internal, uh, their internal talking points. It's very, very hard to hold Turkey out as a model for the Arab world uh, if Erdogan is using the tactics of recently deposed uh, Arab dictators and sometimes going further, <coughs> uh, further than them. I, I think that there are a number of discrete issues with which the United States and Turkey must work together. Syria being one, I think Ukraine is going to become more important in that, especially given the waterway that runs through, uh, through, through Istanbul. But uh, there has been a massive strategic, uh, strategic erosion of Turkey's place in the Middle East, which was supposedly the big partnership that the United States was going to have in Turkey, helping uh, the Middle East with a soft landing. Um, Turkey has bad relations with every major country of the region. Uh, it's left with Erbil and Gaza. Uh, that's not a stellar list. Uh, to, no offense to the, to the Kurds, not to lump them together, but that is different from a country that was going to lead the region, be an example of the region, and so on and so forth. So I think that we are hanging on to certain things because there's there's the border with Syria is important, Iraq is obviously important, Crimea and Ukraine is important, but beyond that, I don't see this big relationship, this big strategic, this model partnership that President Obama uh, talked about in April 2009 when he went to Ankara. Right. So I have a whole long list uh, of additional questions, um, but it's not fair for me to hog the floor, so I'm going to uh, open things up to um, uh, questions from members um, and hope that we'll get to some more of these topics like Kurds, Syria, the economy, Russia in greater depth. Um, when I call on you, please remember to wait for the microphone stand uh, state your affiliation and keep yourself uh, to a short question. Um, David Phillips here. My name is David Phillips at Columbia University. I'm glad that you mentioned the Kurds in your uh, list of things yet to talk about. Uh, what do you think about the PKK peace process? Uh, Achalan made statements from his Imrali prison urging the Kurds to cooperate with the AKP. Do you think that now there's an opportunity for Erdogan to deliver on the democracy opening and to do a serious uh, negotiation with Ocalan and his representatives that includes uh, a DDR program and full democratization? Ari, you want to take that? Um, well, just as a big, uh, back on to David's question, I mean, Turkey has this Kurdish problem, which is 20% of the population is of Kurdish origin, some of whom are actually quite nationalistic. There's been a, a guerrilla war that started in the, back in the 1980s, which is now in a hiatus because there's a ceasefire. Uh, but it is a very serious problem. When you look at the last election results, you kind of see that uh, AKP dominates in terms of, by plurality, winning many of the districts or provinces, but there's a Kurdish political party that won the, the traditionally Kurdish areas, the southeast of Turkey. Um, the Kurds are, think that history is with them. They want autonomy or, or a great deal of what they call democratic autonomy, not necessarily separation from Turkey. But there's also a peace process. And to his credit, I mean, one of the things that Erdogan has done very well, he did a lot of things very well. One of the things he did was to completely reverse the strategy of, as to how to deal with a, the, this restive Kurdish minority in Turkey. And once the military was defeated in Turkey, he could actually start a peace process with the, with the Kurdish uh, Workers' Party. That peace process has been going on for a while, um, but has not really produced much other than the ceasefire. And the question is, what happens next now that we've had these elections in Turkey? My sense is um, that the Kurds don't have any other partner in Turkey. So in a way, they're stuck with Erdogan. They have to continue the process with him because the other two parties either are you know, the main Republican People's Party, who should have been much more social democratic, open to the Kurds, is in fact a quasi-nationalist party. And, the, and then the other main party in, in Turkey is a neo, 
I mean, the best way to describe it is neo-fascist uh, neo, uh, party whose only platform item is being anti-Kurdish. So they don't have anybody to work with except Erdogan. And, but for Erdogan, the peace process is important. There haven't been any body bags in the last year and a half now since the ceasefire started. That has helped him quite a bit. But the Kurds are also wary that this Erdogan is, a, is now damaged, that this is a guy who is, can on a dime change policy, can make you an enemy. So they're very wary. And from what I've been able to gather, I was in northern Iraq uh, recently, and I talked to a lot of people. And my sense is that the PKK, which is the, the Kurdish Stand Workers Party, which, whose headquarters are now in, um, in, in Iraq, northern Iraq, but he's, the leader is in jail in Turkey, they're going to go along, but very, very warily. Not much is going to happen, I suspect, in the, near f in the near future. I mean, that's in it. Let me just add quickly. First, let me just say that, that everything I know about the Kurds, I've learned from Professor Henri Barkey. So, uh, it's, uh, I I, 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 at the risk of, uh, of upsetting my professor. But um, one thing that strikes me directly to get to your, your question, David, is can they go forward? Can they go forward? And I wonder if you look at these election results where the, the, the Nationalist Movement Party, this neo-fascist uh, party that, that Henri was talking about, has done relatively well. And that there is, the AKP does share a constituency with the MHP. And to the extent that Erdogan, if he has in fact been weakened, uh, will have to worry about his nationalist flank, which is what has brought previous efforts to bring the conflict with the PKK to an end. I wonder if he's going to continue to face those dynamics. And as promising as this peace process has been, especially since it's come out into the open, or at least the idea of it has been promising, uh, I wonder whether even now uh, they'll be able to, to move forward, given that slight electoral shift and the idea that the MHP does share an important constituency and Erdogan does always have to worry about his, uh, his national flank, however, however well he's done. Let, let me just add, look, I think it's <coughs> in, in the interest of Erdogan and the country, I would argue, to go with the peace process because the alternative is war, the alternative is the Turkish economy uh, will be really severely hurt by, by start, restarting of the war. The Kurds are fed up of fighting, so they want. So the logic is that the problem, the big problem at the moment, is Erdogan himself because he's become erratic under the under the pressure. So that's that's a big question that I think the Kurds have about him. Um, um, this other, uh, Next question, please. This gentleman here. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Averill Powers, Syzygy Therapeutics. I was hoping you could maybe comment on Ukraine a bit, uh, particularly game out what might happen there and what Erdogan and Turkey's response would be. Well, I, I, you know, it's the, the Turks are in, a, I think, a, a pretty tough spot with regard to Crimea and in Ukraine. Um, first. Uh, it's no secret that, that Erdogan has wanted to improve economic relations with Russia. There is an important energy relationship between uh, the two countries. Uh, despite you know, some uh, statements on the part of the Turkish foreign minister about protecting the Tartar uh, population in, uh, in Crimea and Ukraine, uh, Turkey has put itself within the consensus on NATO which is a good thing for Turkey, that NATO's response so far has been relatively tepid. I think that if things get worse in Ukraine and it requires a stronger NATO response, it's going to put the Turks in uh, an extraordinarily awkward position. I don't imagine that they will, given the significance of this, this is different from Libya, where they kind of put up a lot of resistance to the military operation in Libya. I don't think, given how institutionalized Turkey is in NATO, that this will result in some sort of breach. I think the Turks ultimately fall in line with NATO, but they do have complications in looking at Russia uh, and its uh, desired economic relations, proximity that is, um, I think, certainly uh, going to weigh on Turkish policymakers. The thing I would add is, I mean, there is the 
Putin Erdogan relationship, which is goes beyond the Turkish Russian relationship, that is actually a very personal relationship. Uh, they looked into each other's eyes. They look they into each other's eyes. Yes. Or lack thereof. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. <laughs> I'm so uh, far gone anyway. And um, uh, and that, that relationship, the personal relationship, and maybe the, the maybe other financial I issues involved here, I don't know. So there's that that level. Second is are the tat Tatars, the Crimean Tatars. There are more ta ta Tatars of Crimean origin in Turkey than there are in Crimea. So it's an um, important constituency in, um, in in Turkey that hasn't said much yet. I mean, surprisingly, for uh, Turkish ethnic constituencies tend to talk a lot usually, but they haven't yet. But Third, and actually this is very important, Crimea, okay, you can make an argument that Crimea maybe was not part of uh, uh, Ukraine and that, you know, it was a gift by, by Khrushchev, so you can make, but if you, today's news of problems in, the, in eastern Ukraine is really, really problematic for, for Erdogan because Kurt. borders, Bo you know, you don't play around with borders because if you start playing around with borders anywhere, then you'd have to worry about Kurdistan. Kurdistan in Iraq, Kurdistan in Turkey. Next question, here. Uh, my name is Nuri Haku, I'm a Turkish citizen. Uh, my question would be with regard to peace process uh, with Kurds in Turkey. So it's been more than a year that um, there's not been any deaths, news for soldiers or civilians killed and that helps um, AKP, of course. Um, we just heard from uh, Kurdish leadership that they want to uh, put that peace process on some kind of legal base or platform, but Erdogan rejected that it cannot be on legal basis. And then uh, US ambassador, I think today's paper I read that he says, we encourage Kurdish leaderships for peace process. So what does it mean? and Erdogan or AKP can be trusted on that process. And what happens if PKK or uh, Kurdish movement starts an uh, armed struggle and starts kind of um, unstable situation? Um, Thank you. Um, first of all, we just had municipal elections. I mean, we have to remember that these were municipal elections that became were exaggerated in terms of, usually municipal elections are not that important if you think about it, but it became a, a, an issue of Erdogan's viability. But there are two more elections coming in Turkey. There's a presidential election this summer, and then after that there should be national elections for the parliament, both of which are far more determinant, essentially, of the country's future than simple municipal elections. Um, so I don't expect Erdogan to move on, significantly on the Kurdish issue before the conclusion of both sets of elections. Because he has to decide whether he's going to be president first, and then you know, he has to run for uh, national candidates. So especially with the rise of the na neo-nationalist party, uh, he's going to have to think very carefully. So I don't expect he's going to do much uh, uh, on that particular issue. And, and in some ways, he has, he has a luxury. But fundamentally, in Turkey, when you ask Kurds, what is it that you want? List of three things. Um, and I did this some years ago. I, did a, I went to different types of Kurds, pro-AKP, pro-government Kurds, pro-PKK Kurds, independents. And the three things you always hear is constitutional change. The constitution has to be, has to be changed to change the nature of uh, the Turkish constitution is very nationalistic, very ethnic based, so it has to be changed. Uh, they want, um, the Kurds also want complete cultural autonomy to be able to write, do whatever they want, say whatever they want. And three, devolution of powers to the regions. These are three things that are interconnected and will require enormous amount of change. Nothing will happen in the near future because of these elections. Let's see how the, elections re the election results what happens up there, and then we'll be able to talk about this. Let's get to another subject. Uh, Warren in the back. Uh, Warren Bass from the Wall Street Journal. 
Uh, let me ask you three quick things about Turkey, uh, about Turkey and Syria. What is Erdogan's current objective in Syria? Is he resigned to Bashar al-Assad staying in power there? And how pissed is he with us? Uh, <laughs> and let me just add one, one thing, which is, does the, the shooting down of the Syrian fighter jet last week or the week before signify anything or just a, a particular uh, uh, event driven by circumstance? Let me start. Uh, yes, they've been angry with the United States. And, you know, Erdogan has spent the better part of the life once he switched on Assad. I mean, remember, he used to go on beach vacations with Assad. Uh, he has spent an enormous amount of energy trying to convince, encourage, cajole the United States to intervene in Syria, but just not from Turkish territory. Do it from Jordan. Uh, I think that, at least publicly, his position has not changed on Assad. Assad must go. Uh, the, the question is, how will Assad go? And um, I think it doesn't strike me that they are at all resigned uh, to uh, Assad's staying power and they have used various and sundry ways, including the, uh, some would say turning a blind eye, others would say encouraging jihadist groups uh, as a way of uh, trying, to weaken, uh, trying to weaken Assad. I don't really see a tremendous change in uh, Turkish foreign policy. I think they've gotten some reality on jihadist groups. But that doesn't mean that the Turks aren't deeply, deeply involved in this uh, in a, on a continuing basis. Um, you were, there was three. How mad are they at us? Uh, have they changed as he resigned himself to us? Yeah, I, 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 don't think, um, I don't think that that's the case. But I don't think, in answer to Jonathan's question, that the downing of the Syrian MiG is going to be a fundamental, is augurs a fundamental change in policy. I was struck in my conversations with Turks across the political spectrum about how, few, how there, so few actually want a more engaged, active policy on Syria. This, this Ataturk maxim, peace at home and peace in the world, really has become embedded in the way in which Turks look at the world. And with the Rehanla bombings last May and you know the enormous number of refugees in Turkey, and you have to give the Turks a lot of credit for the way in which they've handled this refugee flow, they still don't believe in the wisdom of getting involved in someone else's uh, civil war. And this is, a, this is a weakness. You heard among opposition and Gezi Park and so on about this kind of foreign policy adventurism that uh, a lot of Turks did not approve of. Next question. The lady here, please. From New School. Uh, since the Ma Mavi Marmara settlement has been made or is about to be made, uh, how do you foresee the Turkish-Israeli relations to be in the next year or so? Um, Mavi Marmara, the reference is to the, sh the ship that tried to break the blockade on Gaza that was uh, boarded by Israeli commandos and resulted in the killing of nine uh, activists, Turkish activists, which has been one of the main uh, problems between Turkey and Israel. There have been reports recently that the two sides are close to a deal. I'm finding it very hard to believe that that's the case. Um, the, what the deal would be, uh, Erdogan has put three conditions, that there should be an, uh, um, uh, apology by BB, two, uh, compensation, and three, the lifting of the blockade on Gaza. Number three is completely unacceptable to the Israelis. They're not going to let the Turks uh, decide their, their, their own security policy. BB has already po apologized, and they're dealing in, on compensation. It's a question of money. But I think Fundamentally, when you look at uh, the AKP and Erdogan, this is a party that is very, very hostile to Turkey. If they're Israel. doing it, Israel. I'm Israel. sorry, to Israel. And, and Turkey. And Tur <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Those uh, that don't vote for it. Um, but uh, I find it very difficult that they will make a deal willingly. They're only doing a deal because they think uh, the Obama administration wants it. The Obama administration has been pushing. Um, there's no real desire for it. The only reason there would be a deal in the near future 
is uh, if Erdogan thinks that his stock in the United States and Europe has declined so much that he needs a few successes in, or a few achievements in foreign policy that the West would like. A better deal on Cyprus? I mean, there is, on Cyprus there's much more movement actually than uh, something with Israel and something with Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. Those are the three issues on which he, he uses foreign policy as a tool to improve his relationship with, with the West. But fundamentally, I don't think there's a great deal of incentive to, to improve much. That, having said that, you have to realize that there are all things that, many things that are happening in Turk, between Turkey and Israel that we don't know about. For instance, because of the war in Syria, Turkish trade that used to go, trucks that used to go through Syria to the Gulf cannot cross. The problem is in Egypt, the Turks and Egyptians have problems over the Suez Canal. So now you have Turkish ships unloading in Haifa, Palestinian drivers taking the stuff from Haifa, going through Palestinian territory into Jordan and into the Gulf. So there is a lot of cooperation between the two countries, and that's probably for fine for both. I just want to quickly underline two things that, that Henri said, and they're both actually related to Egypt. The, I remember a former Egyptian vice president under, during the Sadat period named Ismail Sabri Abdullah said to me, if you want to have good relations with Washington, you have to spend the night in Tel Aviv. And I think that the same calculation is going on right now in Turkey. It was how much pressure are they feeling from Washington? And how much of an incentive is it to improve the relations with Washington that they would have to, they'd have to spend the night in Tel Aviv? The other thing is this third demand of lifting the blockade on Gaza. The real address for that now is Cairo. Because this is what the right. Egyptian, this Egyptian policy is to keep Gaza locked down. Uh, and they've been harsher about it than, uh, than even the I Israelis at, at this point. And then I think the third thing that militates against it, the Israeli public just hates Erdogan. They just hate Erdogan. I think that from a diplomatic perspective, I think it would be good for the Israelis to, and, and, the, and the Turks to, to come to some sort of you know, agreement, some modus vivendi. But it, there is really, I think that the, uh, the, the, the Israeli public is actually opposed right now. There's one more factor here that uh, I should have mentioned. And that 2015 15 is the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. So in a very Machiavellic way, the Turks may want to rebuild their relationship with the Jewish lobby that controls the United States in order to be able to fend off what may be coming down the pike in, in Congress on, on the 100th anniversary because they're really afraid that something really big is coming down. So they may, whatever that, happens, it's going to be because of other reasons, not because they really want to have relations. Mike Moran. Mike Moran from Control Risks. Hello, guys. Um, the, could you talk for a second about the relationship that Turkey now has with Egypt um, and how that has affected, has it caused naturally a, a cozying up to, Syria, to uh, Saudi Arabia? You've mentioned possibly looking the other way uh, on what's going on in Syria right now. But also, how has that affected its stance toward Iran and the talks that are ongoing there? Uh, you know, there was this uh, real sense uh, among Turks that they could bring the Egyptians in particular along. You had this, you know, there are some similarities and I think the country are rich with comparison, which is one of the reasons why I write a, a, about the two of them so often I, I, in comparison. I think that the Turks really felt that they could play this role in Egypt. I'm not sure the Egyptians ever believed that that was the case. I mean, just by way of a funny anecdote, I was in Cairo when Erdogan arrived on his big victory tour in September 2011. And he got a huge welcome from the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and, and others as well. And uh, when he left, it was like he was never there. And I was talking to one of my good Egyptian friends, and he said, oh, yes, the Turks misunderstood us. We were saying, yeah, Ottomans, we meant the furniture, not actually, not actually the Turks, which gives you something about, about, about Egyptian humor. But um, there was, it was the, the Egyptians actually wanted to hold the Turks at arm's length. The three times uh, Foreign Minister Davutov tabled a white paper for strategic cooperation between Egypt and Turkey. And the Egyptians said, if you'd like to invest in Egypt, you're welcome to. 
will, in that very kind of Egyptian way, string out this discussion of a strategic partnership in a way that it wouldn't ever really go anywhere. And then, of course, you had the coup d'etat of July 3rd uh, of last year, which uh, was very much a coup. Uh, and Prime Minister Erdogan, for uh, obvious reasons, um, given Turkey's history with coups d'etat, given uh, the fact that the, the, the AKP has this kind of vision of a, of a Muslim solidarity and Muslim parties and the rise of, of Muslim parties in the region and that it being at the center of it took great offense to what was happening uh, in Egypt. And this has really wrecked the relationship between, uh, between the two countries. Uh, and Turkey simultaneously has encountered problems with other countries in the region, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, an ostensible ally in the fight against Assad. Uh, and once there was the breakthrough of the uh, Iran nuclear agreement, suddenly the Turks who had been moving closer to the United States in terms of uh, sanctions, although it was never foolproof, you should read some of the stuff in terms of the gold trade, but uh, had been moving closer to the United States over a period of many years, had kind of swung back to the Iranians in ways, in a way to kind of hedge their bets uh, in the region. I'm not convinced that the Turkish-Iranian relationship is ever going to get beyond uh, certain kind of instrumental areas, particularly in the energy, uh, in the energy arena. But nevertheless, uh, Erdogan surveying uh, the region and recognizing that you know, zero problems and leadership in the region is, is, are essentially dead, um, where does he now have to go? Well, Te Tehran seems somewhat promising given uh, Turkey's, as I said before, massively eroded strategic situation in the region. We have time for just one or two more questions. Uh, the lady in the back and then this gentleman here. Let's take them together. First you and then you, please. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. I'd like to ask how important is the um, US and Turkey free trade agreement? Can this be a reality? Uh, the Economist this week says that... Just please uh, identify yourself. Uh, Roswell Perkins, a retired lawyer. The Economist says that uh, Erdogan has uh, vastly increased the control over the courts. And um, I wonder to what extent you agree with this and what are its ramifications. U.S.-Turkey free trade and Erdogan in the courts. Right. Let me start with the la last, last question first. Um, we have to be clear about one thing in terms of what's happening in Turkey. There is definitely an increase towards authoritarianism in Turkey, a very significant one. And yes, Erdogan has increased his control over not just the court system, but also the press, as I, as I mentioned earlier. But we also have to be very careful about to, and put things a little bit in context. And that is that, look, Turkey was never a country where you had the rule of law. Not when Erdogan was there and not before. And, you know, Turkey has a justice system, but the way I describe Turkey's justice system is Turkey, uh, the justice system in Turkey is to justice what military music is to music. Um, <laughs> so, but that has always been historical. You can go, two people can give the same speech. One person can be hailed as a hero. The second person gets uh, 30 years for the same speech. So look what's happening today in, in Turkey. Erdogan, who went to jail unjustly for four months, although it was much more of a summer camp type of prison, but anyway, um, because he read a poem by a leading Turkish nationalist thinker, is now persecuting uh, journalist or, or, or columnist who criticized him in one of her columns. And he's, he's, having, um, uh, you know, he's asking the courts to, 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 to send them to jail. But this, ha this has been the Turkish characters. It is an arbitrary system of arbitrary justice. So things haven't changed that much. In fact, the sad thing about what happened with Erdogan is that essentially, um, uh, it's, Turkey went two steps forward, one step backwards for a while. Now it's gone two steps forward and two steps backwards. So we are really, in terms of the justice system, the press, et cetera, where, where Erdogan started uh, before. Yes, the justice system is under his control, but before him, 
It was a military control of the justice system. It's a military told judges how they should uh, um, uh, judge people and how they should uh, persecute. Uh, on the free trade, I don't think there's any Turkish-American free trade going anytime any soon, that's my guess. On, on that issue, in fact, during the deliberations of the Independent Task Force on U.S.-Turkey relations that the Council sponsored, there was a significant amount of debate on uh, whether the United States can legally have a free trade agreement with Turkey because of Turkey's relationship and aspiration to join the European Union, whether that was a legal problem or that was just a policy judgment. But uh, as the United States proceeds with a free trade agreement with Europe, there has been some concern in Ankara about the United States looking after Turkish interests uh, as those negotiations go forward, given, of course, Turkey has a customs union agreement with, uh, with Europe. And some technicalities might leave Turkey on the outside in uh, any kind of free trade agreement. On this question of the judiciary, I, I think you know, what, exactly what Henri is saying is that what the Erdogan and the AKP have done is instead of correcting a problem of a politicized judiciary that was directed at the behest of the military, they've tried to solve their problem with the judiciary by establishing political control over it and melding it in their own, in their own way. So they've, they've, they've solved their own political problem without solving the problem of Turkey's judiciary. And I, I think you know, it's probably appropriate to end on this. In Turkey, as a, a, a US government official said to me recently, I'm on my way there, said, remember, there are no rules in Turkey any longer. There was some semblance of rules, but given the uh, political environment, uh, extraordinarily polarized political environment, and the intention on the part of the AKP to establish political control over, what, of, over an arena that is now unruly, they no longer adhere to at least the quasi-democratic institutions of the state, the institutions of the state. They leverage those things to, to, uh, to advance an, an anti-democratic agenda. Well, we're out of time. Let's uh, use this uh, uplifting note to thank our two <laughs> speakers for inspiring so much optimism about Turkey today and in the future. Thank you all. <laughs>